And joining me now is Congressman Jamie Raskin, a former member of the January 6th Select Committee, and we always like to point out a constitutional scholar in his own right. Um, so, Congressman, I mean, in watching it myself, I it felt to me like the justices collectively had already kind of concluded that they want to keep Trump on the ballot, and this was a search for the rationale as to why. Did it feel that way to you? Yeah, I think a majority of them certainly came in with their minds totally made up, although a lot of them are seeking to hang their hat on a different hook. Some of them like the idea that the president isn't even covered by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which I think the vast majority of the justices reject. Others were congregating around this argument that you were just discussing, that under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, Congress needs to act and the state's don't have the power themselves to enforce the Constitution, which is a somewhat weird doctrine, because under the Supremacy Clause, the Constitution governs every part of our governmental system, the federal courts, the state courts, the federal uh, Congress, the state legislatures, and so on. Uh, and nonetheless, they uh, go are going back uh, to this the Justice Chase opinion uh, in the Griffin decision. And I shouldn't really say Justice Chase, which is what the Supreme Court justices were saying today, because he wasn't acting as a Supreme Court justice. He was acting as what we would call a circuit court judge. He just rendered a decision on his own, which totally contradicted <laughs> the position he had taken just a year earlier in the Jefferson Davis treason trial. And there he was advancing the opinion that um, why doesn't Jefferson Davis try to get off by saying he can't be prosecuted and convicted for treason because it would constitute double jeopardy because he's already been excluded from serving as president by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? As a legal argument, that's totally wrong, of course, because Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is a civil disqualification which can be removed by Congress ultimately. It's not criminal, so there's no double jeopardy. And that was perfectly clear according to the framers of the Constitution. In any event, um, all of it is irrelevant because it's not a binding Supreme Court opinion. So really, they're looking at it afresh. And a lot of them seem to like the argument that Congress needs to act. It was only at the very end of the oral arguments today that people began to focus on what the practical implications of that are. It basically means that they're going to let somebody go forward on the ballot who may indeed be or may likely be an insurrectionist who participated in insurrection, let it go all the way through the various states and get back to, yes, January 6th, in this case, 2025. <laughs> and at that point, if God forbid, a thousand times Donald Trump were to be winning by one or two Electoral College votes, it would be up to the new Congress to decide whether or not he was an insurrectionist barred from holding office rather than running from office, which is what their point is. And if you want to talk about a testy, potentially violent and explosive encounter on the floor of the House of Representatives, the Supreme Court is basically choreographing it. And, right. And, and for the audience to, to, to understand what that what that means, that would mean Mike Johnson, whose majority whip can't count enough for them to pull off the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas, even though they desperately want to do that. That guy who's barely hanging on to his speakership, that House of Representatives would have to decide. I mean, let's go through some of these, because some of them made no sense. There was the question of the self-executing part, meaning, to your point, what they're saying is somebody who didn't meet the age qualification, for instance, could run. They just couldn't serve unless it was remedied by the time they become president. He was making that argument. Well, they might become of age by the time they actually hold the office or somebody who didn't live in the state. Well, they didn't live in the state, but then they move there. And then when they hold the office, then they're qualified. In the case of an insurrection, though, you know, this is somebody who actually attempted to halt the peaceful transfer of power. They would get to go all the way through the process of having enough electoral college votes. And then on January 6th, they would have to get a waiver from Congress that says, it's all right, man you can go ahead and be president, right? That's what you're explaining. And That's right. And it was yeah. galling indeed, 
to, to see Justice Kavanaugh trying to invoke democracy as a value on the side of Donald Trump when Donald Trump and his followers tried to overthrow our constitutional democracy on January 6th. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is all about protecting democracy against those who have proven their propensity to use violence and backroom machinations to try to overthrow the constitutional order, which is precisely what happened on January 6th. But just to understand um, how uh, tortured their argument was, at least as I see it, um, the Trump's lawyers weren't saying that um, Trump can't be barred from holding office. They were just saying he can't be barred from running for right. office. Why? Because the Congress might be able to use its authority uh, by a two-thirds vote to remove the disqualification for him being an insurrectionist. Now, as a practical matter, that will never happen. I can guarantee you, you are not going to have any Democrats, much less 75 or 100 right. Democrats voting to remove that disqual disqualification. But as a legal matter, it's a clever argument, and I was impressed that they were making it. It does show how desperate they are, that that's what it's down to. But as a legal argument, I think you can match that hypothetical with another hypothetical, which is if hypothetically Congress were to remove the two-thirds um, disqualification after Trump has been barred from the ballot in Colorado, nonetheless, the Colorado legislature could then appoint the electors for him. So I would meet their extravagant hypothetical with another hypothetical, uh, which is the Colorado legislature could go ahead and appoint him uh, the electors that would vote for him, or indeed the Electoral College itself could use their reflective, deliberative uh, capacity just to choose him as the president. So, you know, th there's a lot of complications because of the Electoral College. But the bottom line is the Supreme Court has always looked at the electoral system uh, as a practical matter. And as a practical matter, Colorado has been doing the right thing. But this court clearly doesn't want to do the right thing. And so they're going to throw it back to Congress. Nothing is going to happen until potentially January 6th, unless Donald Trump is convicted in on some of the 91 federal criminal offenses that are outstanding against him in court. One of the prevailing questions from the Supreme Court justices today was whether upholding Colorado's decision to disqualify Donald Trump from the ballot would ultimately give an unwarranted amount of power to a single state to decide who gets to be president of the United States. Why should a single state have the ability to make this determination, not only for their own citizens, but for the rest of the nation? Because Article 2 gives them the power to, to appoint their own electors as they see fit. If this court affirms the decision below, determining that President Trump is ineligible to be president, other states would still have to determine what effect that would have on their own state's law and state procedure. Well, I mean, if we, if we affirmed and we said he was ineligible to be president, yes, maybe some states would say, well, you know, we're going to keep him on the ballot anyway. But I mean, really, it's going to have, as Justice Kagan said, the effect of Colorado Colorado deciding, and it's true. Joining me now is Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. She was represented today by Colorado's Solicitor General, Shannon Stevenson, who argued before the Supreme Court. Thank you for being here, Secretary Griswold. So I'll let you answer that question, um, because it did seem that some of the justices had it. Why should Colorado get to decide who can be president of the United States for all the states? Uh, well, first off, I, I don't think that that necessarily would play out like that. But if it did, ultimately, it's up to states how they choose to appoint the electors to the Electoral College. Uh, and it's also up to states, uh, as far as we know, as of now, to be able to have ineligible people kept off their ballots. Uh, you know, one of the things that really was striking to me about the court's argument is that if they are so focused on political outcomes, mm. if they're so focused on one state having the ability to swing a presidential election, well, why don't they look towards Georgia and their voter suppression laws? Why don't they look at the states that are trying to swing elections by suppressing the vote? Uh, so ultimately, I, I think um, that line of, of uh, argument is, is not founded in the Constitution, but we'll see what the United States Supreme Court decides.
It's such a good question. I'd love to ask John Roberts, who, since he was a young lawyer in the Reagan administration, has been opposed to the Voting Rights Act. So I bet they'd have a fascinating answer. But it's a good point. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, there were, what did you make of the part of the of the debate that talked about other forms of ineligibility? If somebody from uh, that was born outside the United States said, "I want to be on the ballot," could you disqualify? Could they be disqualified from being on the ballot if somebody was under the required age constitutionally, um, or if someone didn't even live in Colorado? Could 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 you all exclude them? What did you make of that part of the argument? Because it didn't seem clear. It seemed almost as if the argument from Trump's lawyers was whoever wanted to run, right, in theory could at least run and then it would be resolved later if they win. I would say the Trump attorneys went even further. Um, not only was the argument that all ineligible people should be able to be on the ballot, they went so far as to argue that every insurrectionist has the right to be on the ballot. And even if Trump was found guilty under criminal insurrection, he could still be on the ballot in president because presidential immunity. So it's just one more, uh, one more of the same playbook from Donald Trump. He refuses to recognize what he did. What he did was incite a violent mob, cause congressmen to run in fear of their lives and assault the Constitution in an insurrection. Uh, and he continues to say, even if he is guilty of the insurrection of other crimes, well, it's fine because the laws and the Constitution just don't apply to him. Uh, so I sure hope that the United States Supreme Court sees through the Trump mob boss mentality and makes him face conse the consequences for his actions. In the, under the argument, you know, you're an attorney, so you can explain this. Under the argument that was made today, could a Jefferson Davis, somebody who had to your point, committed insurrection, then turn around and run. Because it, it wasn't clear to me who, in their mind, could not be on the ballot. Well, I, I, th I think just to take one step back, we shouldn't read too much into the questions the justices are asking. Uh, you know, in the Colorado Supreme Court, some of the justices who ended up disqualifying President Trump from the ballot were asking pretty aggressive questions that would lead you to think that they were on the other side. Uh, so I, I do think it's it's premature. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of this is it's such an unprecedented situation because it was literally quite some time since the Civil War that we had an insurrection like this. Yeah. Donald Trump broke the law. He needs to face consequences for everything he did to try to steal the presidential election, which was not just the insurrection. Let me let me play one soundbite for you. This is Chief Justice Roberts on because the other thing they seem to be concerned about, as you pointed out, were the political consequences of taking Donald Trump off the ballot. Take a listen. I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. Well, certainly, Your Honor, the fact that there are potential frivolous applications of a constitutional provision isn't a reason— Well, no, hold on. I mean, you might think they're frivolous, but probably the people who are bringing them may not think they're frivolous. Is that a, something we should consider and be concerned about? Well, I, I guess the United States Supreme Court is, um, but I personally do not think that far-right Republican witch hunts are a reason to not apply the Constitution to Trump's action in the insurrection. Uh, you know, there can be bad political actors that uh, accuse this, that, and the other, but we have a judicial system. Uh, and just like in Colorado, uh, Donald Trump had a five-day trial. He had an appeals process to the Colorado Supreme Court and then ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, this, this case isn't based on political accusation. It's based on real fact, testimony, witnesses, and a judicial proceeding. Uh, so I, I sure hope the court does not focus his decision on that, because temper tantrums from a political party is not good reasoning uh, to not enforce the law and protect the nation from an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, thank you. Thank you for your time.
And joining me now is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. Uh, Senator, before I get to the Supreme Court uh, goings on today, I just want to get your comment on this, uh, this special counsel report that I'm holding in my hot little hands here uh, about the Biden classified documents situation, their non-prosecution decision. Your thoughts? Well, the uh, Department of Justice did what it should do, which is to appoint a special prosecutor, a special counsel to look into the matter. Special counsel is independent, looked into the matter, decided there is nothing to prosecute. As far as I'm concerned, that settles the question. Well, we will hear what the president has to say about it uh, a little bit later on in the hour. But I do want to get to this this hearing today. It was fascinating to listen to. And just to my ear, just listening to it uh, as these oral arguments were made, it was striking to me to hear the first voice uh, in each of the segments and sessions being uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. He is the senior most judge, which is for our audience why he was allowed to speak first each time. So he gets that deference. But uh, I think we all remember that his wife, Jenny Thomas, was materially involved in the insurrection. She sent multiple emails to Mark Meadows. She was a huge advocate of Donald Trump remaining in power after losing the election. I could go on and on and on. These guys did sign uh, this brand new ethics, um, you know, their, their new, their sort of new ethics guidelines. What do you make of the fact that he did not recuse? Well, let's start with the fact that the failure to recuse isn't just an ethics violation, it's a violation of law. Congress passed a law requiring recusal in certain circumstances. So this isn't just something within the judicial branch that's just a matter of, you know, judicial propriety. It's law-breaking to sit on a case where you don't belong. And with respect to Thomas, this is the third time he has sat on and decided a case related to the insurrection, sat on the case of the January 6th commission's access to records, which might well have revealed the records of his wife's contacts with the Trump chief of staff. He sat on the Arizona uh, election investigation case uh, after his wife was involved with calling into Arizona to ask to have ballots overturned. And now he's involved in this case. And the problem across all three of those cases is we don't know what the facts are. In any other proceeding, you'd have to do some sort of fact-finding. You'd know what his wife did, what he knew, when he knew it, and all of that is simply not present. This Supreme Court hides behind a cloud of uh, obscurity with respect to the facts, and that allows a judge like Thomas to make his own decision without anybody being able to check on him and say, well, actually, you know, on those facts, that's not right. You start with fact-finding in any legal matter, and the court refuses to allow fact-finding. Right. I mean, it, it just was sort of striking to see, you know, you, you call them a Leo Six, if you want, Leonard Leo's pals there. I mean, you have Samuel yeah. Alito arguing across the room from the guy who wrote the bounty hunter bill in Texas, his, con, you know, his co-conspirator in trying to deprive women of rights over their own bodies. You've got the, uh, you know, and he's also another uh, vacation, uh, expensive vacation fan. You've got three people who sat on the who were worked for George W. Bush in the Bush v. Gore case, including Chief Justice Roberts, uh, Amy Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh being the other two, arguing that one state shouldn't get to decide who the president is. Hello. That was the case y'all worked on um, yeah. in Bush v. Gore. They let Florida decide. They, they decided it for Florida. Correct. One state. Correct. And so it just I wonder if we're at a point now where the Supreme Court's reputation is so desiccated that a you know ruling to keep Trump on the ballot, which seems to me to be their sort of political decision that they want to make, will just feel kind of grimy to a lot of Americans. I think it will. And it's not just the Supreme Court as an institution. It's also the uh, principles that they purport to champion. If you listen to the argument, the questions were all about, well, what happens if, and what are the political outcomes? What are the results? What are the policy outcomes? How do we balance the interests here? Those are all considerations that they pretend to scorn. They pretend to be plain language folks, strict constructionists, originalists, until plain language, strict construction, and originalism would lead them to throw Trump off the ballot. 
in Colorado. And then suddenly all the documents that they've long purported to scorn are the ones that are driving their questioning. 